Oh, what a beautiful sight. This is much more than a wheelbarrow. I completely understand why the, the Celts used to bury their, their important people with their carts. A wheeled cart is a magnificent thing. It allows you to transport materials over long distances. And just like a horse, your cart can become one with you, you know. I'm waxing poetic about the wheelbarrow, but this thing really does allow me to do things that I couldn't do without it. This has been developed over time to carry high volume, low density materials. Um, in my case, primarily shredded bark, although there are other things that represent, you know, are represented by the terms high volume, low density, you know, hay, straw, leaves, whatever. This isn't for carrying rocks, although I do carry rocks with it. Um, I have a metal one, you know, that's for more rugged duty, lower volume stuff. But old Relentless here, every year gets awoken from her slumber or his slumber, depends on your viewpoint, it's slumber. And I get 40 cubic yards of shredded bark. Actually a little more because it's the truck is the truck is loaded heavy um, with both trips. And so I estimate I'm carrying a total of 35 cubic yards vast distances. Mo a lot of it gets used up here, but probably about 35, 36 cubic yards gets moved down the trail. Which means that I'm pushing this day after day after day, total of about 40 miles. I calculated it. I count my steps. I have a map that you know, how many loads per trail and in what spots. A um, little, little impulsive in that way. But the box on this is a perfect design. It could not be improved upon for carrying this shredded bark, this material. The nice thing about it, you notice it's a little, little taller on the front than it is in the back. What that does is it gives me balance. And so when this is fully loaded, I'm not using my back in the same way as you would use, say, the standard wheelbarrow that has the, the wheel way out here and then the bin or the bucket um, closer to you. So I'm not lifting any weight this way. It's all a matter of pushing. Up till now, this has been a jump in technology this year. I have, let me turn it this way, and it's kind of a Dr. Seuss color scheme here because it's a Frankenstein type of cart. I have two wheels. This is going to, in the course of 40 miles, game of inches, you know, any little bit over every mile I cover of effort that I can save benefits me. Instead of having a one wheel, which I had to, uh, one wheel up till, you know, a couple days ago, I had to balance it. And I got pretty good. I could actually push it one-handed because I have so many miles on here. If you figure I've been here about 25 years, 40 miles a year just with the bark. You know, it's a lot of miles, so I've got a lot of experience, but I am using more effort balancing on one wheel. So I decided to get one of these handy little two-wheeled undercarriages. The metal box is now on the original running gear for this. So now I have one that I can knock around with um, a post hole digger and not break it like I did my wife's poly bucketed wheelbarrow. Punched right through it with a post hole digger. Simple matter of just building new wheel wells. No big deal, you know, a little bit of... A little bit of plywood, a little bit of cutting and measuring, nailing together, so that was no issue. I have a Lexan plug over the original wheel well here. I didn't have plywood, so I used Lexan. Now I can see the sharks flowing under my boat. Yeah. I did replace, if you know wheelbarrows, they have like this nose piece here. I replaced that with this plywood um, plate simply because, let me demonstrate. With that nose piece, if I hit an angle, it dug in. And that hurts, let me tell you, because I have to run on the shredded bark portion. On the boardwalk, I can walk. But on the shredded bark portion, I actually have to run pushing the load. And I tend to raise the handles when I'm pushing, because sometimes I have to bump it with my chest if it gets hung up or start encountering too much resistance. And I tell you, if you're like running off the shredded bark and hitting a boardwalk, which sometimes because of the spring and the frosty is up about four inches from the trail surface, you hit that with that nose piece and you stop dead from a run, it hurts. And with that plate, 
I get this angle. When I had that plate on here, as soon as I raised it to this point, I was in a danger zone. So that plate helped immensely. Uh, I have details on the side. I'm going to rotate this 360 degrees, and I want you to notice something that may or may not make sense. Why do I have these parts on here? And this is what makes this the jackknife, I'm on the catwalk, of wheelbarrows. I'll give you a minute to decide upon or discuss with yourselves what do you see on this wheelbarrow that doesn't quite make sense. Exactly. Good one. These things. What are those? Let's see if I can find some plywood here. What these things are is, notice how that slips in there? I have um, structures on the back side, and sometimes when I'm redoing those, I have to carry four by eight sheets of material. And instead of like lugging them down a the trail, I can take two four by eight sheets of half inch plywood or, you know, whatever, T111, and just slide them in there, shoot, sit them, take a length of rope with a canoe knot up here, boom. And I'm able to carry two four by eight sheets of plywood on this thing. Ha <laughs> ha tricky, I know. And that is why, my friends, whether or not you believe in the flat earth or it's spherical earth, we all believe in wheelbarrows. And so I present to you the world's perfect trail duty wheelbarrow. You may copy it. You certainly aren't going to buy another one just right off of Amazon because if you search the best wheelbarrows, you don't see anything like this. This is an individual but yet, you could have one at home if you were a little crafty. Just tip it up so you can see the tricky wheel. Oh, isn't it nice? There we go. Now I'm going to make a few laps with this empty around the trails because the bark is going to get here in a couple weeks and I don't want to like start cold. So get my, my legs and my back and my arms and my balance all together and tracking on the twisty turns of the boardwalk to be prepared for when zero hour arrives. Thanks for watching. And for those crossbow interested people out there, man, 320 yards. I'm only 80 yards away from 400 now. You know, it was first, can I do 250? Ooh, yes, did 285. That's close to 300. Can I do 300? Once I brace the big crossbow, you know, to the point where it should be, three inches, maybe I can go four, and the sea dried dry it a little bit more, you know, it blew past 300, no problem, even with a stiff side wind. And so, what if I do add a little nose weight to it? The one, the bolts that I used to break 300 didn't have field points on them, so if I put 150s or 200s on there, it's... It very well could increase the distance and you're thinking well heavier ones won't fly as far but in fact what I was noticing when with the string I can tell you know is this thing using all the the, the energy in that bow to propel the arrows or the bolts and I don't believe it was because the string kept going um, hard enough that it would like poof, get stuck on the end of the tiller so I do believe I can add a little mass there to give it more inertia, momentum, whatever, um, to make them fly further. It's a tricky balance. Not a lot of weight. I need to find that optimum weight for these things. And I think just by studying that string that I could go a little bit more, which would allow it to fly further. Conversely, I don't know if you remember, I used a much lighter bolt. I forget, 500 grains or something like that. It didn't fly nearly as far as the ones I had because it was just wasting so much energy. Um, the, in, in some ways, it's a function of how fast do the limbs respond, and that's why flight arrows are, can be very light, down to 115 grains, um, because those limbs respond really fast. But there's a, a limit to how fast my heavy 72-inch limbs can respond. And... I don't think I'm maximizing it. I think that they'll respond just about as fast if I add another 150, 200 grains to it, um, infuse the bolts, arrows, with a little bit more kinetic energy, but we'll see. And yes, it was a good suggestion. I could probably thin down the veins a little bit 
also make them a little lower to give a little less wind resistance. And when you're talking percentages, 320 yards to 400, um, that's not much. And the combination of a little more bracing, a little more sinew drying, curing, a little more mass, maybe a little bit more brace height. Hey, it's just 80 yards we're talking. I think I can do 400. 400! And I'm going to stop it at that because I don't think I can do 500. That would just, that would be like amazing, but I don't think it's possible with my Ash Longbow. Now, if you've stuck with this video this long, in for a penny, in for a pound, um, I do think it's quite amazing that when you look at old accounts, I think they were from France from the Middle Ages, Argonkort era, possibly. They were saying that the, the, the U English longbows could throw their arrows 360 yards there and about. So I'm pretty close. And whereas we all grew up thinking, and we know that U is a superior bowwood over Ash, this Ash bow performed rather well. Um, with that, time to get back to work. Make sure that the sign is up. We're opening tomorrow. It's a little late. Normally we open the 15th, but man, I am still using my snow blower. I still have snow blowing to do today in the parking lot. It's ridiculous. But it is what it is. I guess if you're given snow, make snow cones.